Okay. Good evening. My name is Beth Meyerhoff, and I'm the PVP Council of PTA's legislative representative. And it has been my privilege, along with Council President Heather Matson and Ledge Rep Yasminka Kriley, to help organize this event with the League of Women Voters. PTA is a nonpartisan membership advocacy organization, and our mission is to positively impact the lives of all children and families. PTA has a long, successful history of influencing policy resulting in kindergarten classes, child labor laws, school lunch programs, a juvenile justice system, and strengthened parent-teacher relationships. Last month, Governor Brown signed into law Assembly Bill 2878, sponsored by California State PTA, to add research-based family engagement guidance and practice into the California Education Code. And locally, our PTAs offer the Art at Your Fingertips project to teach art in our elementary schools, and we support the National PTA Reflections Program. And we provide disaster supplies and support training and drills, and we offer programs to encourage parent involvement, such as family nights and fun runs. And PTA is committed to civic engagement, and we organize an annual trip to Sacramento called Capital Convoy, which gives our students, teachers, and parents a chance to advocate for our PTA and school district priorities. Children and families have been and remain PTA priorities, and by joining a local PTA or the Golden State PTA, you help us to continue to advocate for our greatest resource, our children. So thank you for joining us tonight to learn about the candidates for the PVP USD School Board, and I'd like to introduce Nancy Moore with the League of Women Voters with whom our PVP Council of PTAs partnered to organize this event tonight. Well, as Beth said, I'm Nancy Marr, and I'm the Voter Service Director uh, for the League of Women Voters of the Palos Verdes Peninsula. And the League is very pleased to be working with the PTA Council in presenting this forum tonight. And I want to thank all of the uh, League and PTA members who uh, were volunteers and worked to help put the forum together uh, to assist you voters in the coming election. Now I want to say just a couple of words about the League. We have to have our commercials, you know. <laughs> the League of Women Voters is a nonprofit organization that works for good government, citizen education, and citizen participation. The League also is a nonpartisan political organization. We do take stands on issues, but we de never endorse or oppose candidates or political parties. Civility in discussion of public issues is an important League principle. So we ask courtesy in all comments and responses tonight, both from the audience and from our candidates. I want to note just a couple of other election activities that are coming up this month. Um, there is a candidate forum here in this room on Saturday, this coming Saturday, the 13th, 10 in the morning until noon for the State Assembly and State Senate Districts. They're can the candidates for those seats. Um, on Monday night, the 15th, at the PV Center Library, there will be a presentation on the ballot measures, pros and cons, in the uh, community room from seven to nine. And another one on uh, Saturday the 20th from two to four in the afternoon at the San Pedro Library. And lastly, there is on the 23rd, another forum for the school board candidates that will be sponsored by the Chamber of Commerce and the Council of Homeowners Association with the League of Women Voters. And now I'd like to introduce the moderator for the evening, a very experienced moderator and experienced League of Women Voters member, Mary Ellen Barnes. Thank you, Nancy. Good evening, everybody, and welcome to our Candidates Forum. I want to go over the, the format and the ground rules so that the candidates understand and the audience understands. We're taking only written questions this evening from the audience, so if you have a question or want to write a question out, raise your hand, and one of the people around the edge of the room will give you a card and a, and a, you know, and a pencil. And then they come up here. And uh, we're going to try to ask every question that we get 
if your question doesn't get answered, it's not because we're censoring you. Truly, it's because either we ran out of time or the question basically was already asked before, you know, in a slightly different way. But, you know, how many times are we going to ask people essentially the same question? Um, all of our candidates tonight have agreed to abide by our timetable and, um, and our rules. Uh, so after I introduce the candidates, they're going to each have two minutes for their opening statements. Uh, they, they drew little numbers to where they're sitting. So uh, when we do the opening statements, we'll be starting with Megan and working our way down. And when we do closing statements, we'll be starting down at the far end with Rick and working our way back. So everybody will get a chance to be first, second, third, and fourth in things. After the, after the opening statements, they will have a minute and a half, up to a minute and a half, to answer each question. And the closing statements are one minute each. Um, so that's how we're going to do it. We have two timekeepers tonight. We have Cindy Condon up here and Ellen Aiken, and they're right here in front. They will be letting you know when, um, what, 30 seconds? Is that what we're doing? 30 seconds, and um, we're going to... One minute, so on your opening statement, we'll give you the one minute mark, the 30 second, and then they'll get a little stop sign. Uh, and when you get to the stop sign, it would be nice if you could wrap up. I will let you kind of finish your thought. You don't have to stop mid-sentence, but you know, don't, like, don't abuse it and keep going on for you know, forever and ever, because if you do, then I will just cut you off. <laughs> so that's how that works. Um, this is designed to provide a nonpartisan setting for undecided voters to hear everybody's position on questions. So we really don't want, you know, like somebody's cheering section, you know, or booing, that kind of thing. That's out of order. And if you do that, I will ask you to leave the room. So now I would like to introduce our candidates. So starting down this end with Ms. Megan Crawford, Dr. Jeannie Hahn, Mr. Matthew Brock, and Mr. Rick Phillips. So now we're going to begin with our opening statements, and we're starting with Megan. And Megan, you have two minutes. Hello, everyone. My name is Megan Crawford, and I'm running for a position on the Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School Board. I want to thank everyone for coming here today to hear from all of the candidates for the Board of Education. I'm running because I want to make a difference and give back to my community. I have grown up in Palos Verdes my whole life and attended the wonderful schools that are found here. I went to Rancho Vista Elementary School, Marilest Intermediate, and Palos Verdes Peninsula High School. With the high quality of education I received here, I then moved on, moved on to earn an AA degree from Marymount California University on the Hill. Um, and then I went to UCLA and received my bachelor's degree. And then I decided to go into teaching and got my multiple subject teaching credential and Master of Arts in Education from Pepperdine. I am now attending USC, where I'm working towards my Master of Public Administration. I want to make sure that students in my community have as great of schools or better as when I attended. As a former student in the district and now a current sixth grade math and science teacher in Redondo Beach, I believe this unique perspective is what is needed for the district to continue to remain great and make some adjustments where needed. As a teacher, I'm an advocate for students and help them daily. And as a board member, I will make sure that any decisions I make put students first. I am bringing a diversity of expertise again that is desperately needed. I also think it is important to encourage the younger members of our community to get involved in their local government. And I think that my youth is an asset because I am passionate, I have high energy, and I'll bring new ideas to our schools. The top issues I want to focus on for this school district include balancing the budget, focusing on high quality curriculum and education, listening to teachers' opinions and ideas, improving student wellness, both physical and mental, and also student safety, sustainability in the district, and extending community partnerships. Thank you. Thank you. Jeannie. Hello, my name is Dr. Jeannie Hahn, and I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist. I received my PhD in sociology of marriage and family therapy from USC. I have two children in the district. One is an eighth grader at Ridgecrest and the other is an 11th grader at Penn. 
I fell in love with this district the moment I walked into the kindergarten room at Soleado Elementary School. And that started my activities and being involved in the PTA, the Booster Club, and even on site council. I have a track record of bringing real change to policies and programs in the school district. I spearheaded the change to non-toxic cleaning products in the school district, and now the whole school district is using non-toxic cleaning products in every school and in every site that we use. I also chaired the AC Ridgecrest Air Conditioning Task Force, which lobbied the school district to work on the high temperatures in our classrooms in Ridgecrest, which reached up to almost 90 degrees for our kids. At that time, parents, the PTA, and teachers, we all worked together to ask the school district for help. And in that, we became the first school district that had um, cool water fountains. And this year, we have a $1.4 million upgrade for our electrical grid, which is the first step to having air conditioning at Ridgecrest. And I'm very proud that I was able to work on that. You know what, I'm very solution focused. I do not come with a problem without working on a solution, and I'm a hard worker. And as a therapist, I have to tell you that I really believe that mental health is really important. And one of the things I would like to do is to have a budget that's reader friendly, to have a glossary of terms, and also to have footnotes for, to understand the different categories in our school. You know, the most important thing is we could have a school district that is academically high achieving for everyone, but also to have safe, successful, and most of all, happy children in our school district. If we could have that, we would be such a wonderful school district. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Hi, thank you for hosting us. Hi, I'm Matthew Brock, a father of two Palos Verde students, a son at Penn High and a daughter at PVIS. So during the course of the campaign, the most common question I get is, why did you decide to run? And it is a difficult decision to run. You're putting yourself out into a whole new world. Uh, but what I did was, you know, as a board member of the PTA at Montemalaga, I'd experienced firsthand the wonderful relationship the parents had with the schools. But when it came to the district, it wasn't quite the same. There was a lack of trust, and parents just didn't feel the same way. So I asked myself what I could contribute. I'm a parent, an, an active and involved member of the PTA. I was a high school coach, and I have a background in counterterrorism. I truly felt that the experience I have could benefit the district. I am periodically visited, ah, sorry. <laughs> I have personally visited the 17 schools on the Hill. And you know, I met with the principals and the teachers, and it was wonderful just to see how great our schools are. And our schools are great because of the parent involvement. It's because of the PTA. It's because of the boosters. And we need to make sure that that continues. From voyagers to sea kings, from marauders to raiders, and eagles to panthers. They are wonderful because of the collaboration. And we need to bring that same spirit of teamwork to the district. We share a common goal, and that goal is to produce terrific students and terrific people who are ready to go out into the world. Thank you. Thank you. Rick. Good evening. I want to thank the League of Women Voters and the PTA Coordinating Council for hosting tonight's candidate forum. I appreciate this opportunity to discuss the issues with you, the voters, and also hear my fellow candidates' views. I've been honored to serve our community as a member of the Palos Verdes Peninsula Unified School District Board this past year. My wife, Allison, and I have lived in the community for over 20 years and are the parents of two boys who graduated from and benefited greatly from attending Palos Verdes schools from TK through 12th grade. Allison and I have volunteered extensively in the community and the schools, she through the PTA, me, myself through the PEF, both of us through the booster clubs, and since semi-retiring in 2013, I've devoted even more time to community boards. As part of the board, I've always focused on solving issues in the best interests of the students. My ability to think independently, solve problems creatively, and listen to multiple viewpoints have enabled me to be an effective board member. 
In addition, I bring 20 years of professional finance experience, which I believe is one of the primary reasons that the board appointed me in February to fill a vacancy. I'm proud to report that as we enter this, this school year, we actually have a bu balanced budget after multiple years of deficit spending. 2012 was the last year that we actually ran a surplus and did not deficit spend. As many of you know, this was also a year of transition for the leadership of the district. Hiring a superintendent is really the most important job the Board of Education does. By engaging in a national search, we successfully recruited Alex Chernis to be our new superintendent. We recruited him from the number one academically ranked district in the state, and he also has extensive fiscal management experience. If elected, my priorities include academic excellence, long-term fiscal responsibility, student wellness, increased board transparency, and increasing community involvement. Throughout my tenure on the board, I have established a proven track record of voting according to what I sincerely believe is the best interest of all our students. Thank you. Thank you. All right, now we're gonna start with the first question and because Megan went first with the, with the um, opening statements, we'll start with Jeannie and work our way down and Megan will be last, okay? So no surprises here. <laughs> all right. Um, what life experiences qualify you for being on the school board? Well, one of the things I've been hearing in the district is the mental health of our kids. Parents have told me, and my daughter's friends, and even I see it at home, that our kids are stressed, that our kids have anxiety. We're daily breeze, four, three years ago, talked about we had a 30% increase of suicide kids reporting they wanted to commit suicide. It's an epidemic in our school district. My mental health background helps me to look at, this, look at the programs that were working with the school district, but it also helps me to understand what's happening to our kids in a systemic level and to also look at solutions that we could have. One of the things I would love to bring is the whole idea of mindfulness into our school district. You know, mindfulness is one of those, I'm so sorry, does that mean I have to finish soon? Okay, I'm sorry, I did, uh, no. mindfulness is one of the things we like to bring, and studies have shown that it has reduced stress and also increased math ability. So it's one of the things that I could bring is my expertise in um, marriage and family therapy background. Okay, thank you. Matt. Thank you. As a former high school coach, I have experienced some of the same joys and frustrations our teachers have. My experience provides empathy and understanding and a desire to support our educators. As a government contracted subject expert in counterterrorism and force protection, I can provide crucial insight into the security concerns facing our campuses and the dangers our students are facing both externally and internally. I completely agree with Jeannie that mental health is a serious issue in our district. As a small business owner and a member of the PTA, I understand how to work with limited budgets and how to watch every dollar, and yet not lose sight of what is important, the development and the growth of our students. Okay, thank you. Rick, life experiences. Well, first off, I'm on the board, so that's, that's kind of a unique experience. But uh, I also am a parent of two kids that actually experienced the whole school system all the way from TK through 12th grade. Um, in addition, I have a lot of board experience in not just on the school board, both in for-profit boards and in non-profit boards. And so I think that that helps me understand the proper role of a board, which really is to set policies and provide governance and not to manage the school district. And it's important to realize that on the board, our job is to hire one person in the district, the superintendent. The superintendent hires everybody else, including all the principals, and it's really the superintendent's and the principal's jobs to manage the site. And it, so is, is one minute, is that the end, okay. or is that? No, well, okay, you have a minute and a half to answer, and she's just counting down, so she's saying, you're at the one minute mark, you have one minute left, essentially. Okay, okay. So, I to, okay. so I have one minute left, all right, all right. Yeah. But, but, but I'll yield the rest well, I know, of my that's time. that's confusing, I'm sorry, yeah. Right, I, I, I'm just a little confused on that. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, so did you, or okay, I, I couldn't quite tell. You were just confused there. Okay, uh, Megan, life experiences. 
Yeah, well, um, life experiences, I know that everyone's talking about being a parent of schools in the district, but I actually went through the school system here. This is my actual life experience. Um, I went through K through 12 schools here, so I've lived it, right? And so I want to give back to my community. Like Matt said, the goal is to have terrific students that graduate and go out into the world. Hopefully, that, I think that's me, and I'm coming back to give back to my community. Um, as far as other experience, I am a teacher, like I stated before. And so my goal is to help all students. Um, speaking of uh, goals as well, the superintendent came out with some goals yesterday. And so he stated that 25% of our students are below grade level in math and language arts. So there's something we need to do about that. Um, as a teacher at Paris Middle School in Redondo Beach, we have this program called Tutorial, which is basically, basically an intervention program for students. It gives them 30 minutes twice a week where they can go into teachers and get that extra help that they need. And so that's one way that I think that we can reduce our uh, students that are not meeting grade level, and all of those things are important, and I bring that life experience being a student and being a teacher. Um, lastly, my MPA degree, uh, that teaches me to look at um, problems that are occurring and all solutions uh, that we can come up with, analyze the pros and cons of each, and also think about what stakeholders are going to be affected with each decision that we make. It's important that we get that community feedback as well. Okay, great, thank you. All right, we're gonna start this question with Matt and then it'll go to Rick and then to Megan, like that. Okay, describe your experience with organizational budgets. Uh, as a member of the PTA for two years, um, we dealt with actually large budgets. I think our budget was right around $170,000. And it was important that every dollar that we spent went towards a goal, which was making the school better for our students. And it is important to keep that in mind that every dollar that we have needs to go back into supporting our students. You know, we have wonderful programs that the PTA provides, and they are enhancement opportunities. Uh, I think that was my favorite thing visiting all the schools, was how unique they are. That each one has their own identity, each one has their own character, and the parents are the ones who are driving that. And I truly enjoyed that experience. Uh, knowing that and making sure that every dollar, as I mentioned before, was spent wisely. It wasn't, you have to treat every dollar as if somebody made a distinct decision to give you that dollar. You can't just take it for granted. We have limited money, we have limited funds, and we need to make sure that we are putting the money where it belongs. Thank you. Rick. So my, my experience with organizational budgets really goes back over 30 years when I was with Hughes Aircraft and was a you know, program manager, project manager, and I had to deal with the budget. You know, the government said they needed something. We had to build it, and we had to find a way to get it done on that budget. Uh, and it involved, you know, managing lots of people and it involved managing lots of tasks. You know, since that time at Hughes, I went on to get an MBA in finance at UCLA. That gave me further expertise in understanding finance and financials and how to interpret them. For 15 years after that, uh, you know, I was an investment banker advising CEOs in terms of how to deal with their financial situations and how to, um, how to best position their companies and the financial results to give them the optimal result for the outcomes they wanted. Uh, and I also ran my own business. I had my own business that I, that I managed um, and was CEO of for five years. Small business, wasn't as big as the school district. School district, we have a $125 million budget approximately. As I said, one of the things that I'm proud of is that I was part of the board that actually brought a balanced budget to the district. When I came onto the board, last year the budget was uh, in deficit at $6 million. Uh, when we closed the year, it was at $3 million. Uh, and uh, we had passed a budget that was a million dollars looking forward into this year. And due part, largely to um, some of the, the upside in terms of how the budget got passed by the state, we ended up actually with a, a balanced budget right now for the first time in 12 years. Or Thank sorry, 2012. Thank you. Okay, Megan. Um, so I guess 
Um, a couple things. Uh, I do balance my budget in everyday life. Uh, a teacher paycheck is slightly different than everyone else. We don't get paid every month. And so um, I do get paid 11 months out of the year. And so with my own personal budget, I do have to make sure that I have enough for each month, right, and other things uh, that are going on. So um, I have that. Also, um, I was a leader of my social committee at my middle school. And so uh, that was to build teacher camaraderie and uh, get teachers to do more activities together. And so I collected funds from people, needed to make sure that we had enough funds to supply breakfast, lunches, and things like that. Um, but I think it is important, the main thing we want is someone who we can trust with our money, right? And so it is important that we are fiscally responsible. We are stewards of public funds and we need to put our money where our priorities are. And I think really most of it belongs in the classroom. And so if elected, I will do uh, the best job that I can along with my fellow board members to make sure that we are be being fiscally responsible with our decisions. Um, and I know that a lot of our money comes from the ADA with students. We also have about three million a year with our education, uh, Peninsula Education Foundation, as well as about seven to eight million a year with parcel tax. And so it is important that we be as fiscally responsible as possible with our budget. Thank you. Jeannie. Um, I've sat on many PTA boards, and if you ever have sat on the PTA board, the one thing we always talk about is budget, because budget drives our school. And we, what we do is we ha get money from parents who give us, donate the money. And can I tell you that there's times and I've talked to the parents, and we've sat there, and we agonize of what we can pay for and what we can't. One of the things that we're, this Ridgecrest is looking at is field trips, because the bus fare has gone up. And we have to make those hard decisions. And then we have to figure out how to fundraise for those things. And then we have to talk about these issues that we can. And so when we work at the budget, when, when you're on the PTA, you get a certain amount of money and you have to make that decision. And you have to figure out how to spend it. And so working on the PTA has really helped me with organization of budget. And also I think the one thing that's really helped me to do is to really analyze what programs are working and what programs are not. What should we fund and what should we not fund? And that's really important to understand when you're on the PTA and as a parent. And also it translates to the budget of the district. Because sometimes when you see things, when you see it on the grass level and when you see it in the grass level, what's happening at the school, Sometimes that is what's really important. That's what you have to see, and that is what our money. And also when you talk to parents, like having world language at the elementary school level, we need to look at things that our kids need and how can we budget for that? Also at the PTA level, at the school level, but also at the district level. Thank you. Okay, this question we're gonna start with Rick. <laughs> there are student representatives who sit with the school board. What would you think of an elementary, middle school, and high school representative also sitting with the school board? I mean, I, I have no objection to the elementary or middle schools having representatives. What I do have an objection to is that the way we use and involve our student representatives right now. Uh, under California law, student representatives are allowed a preference vote. Uh, which means that they get to vote on the issues and they actually get to participate in the board discussions and provide the input of the students, which is really the point of having, having the student representatives on the board. Unfortunately, the board really hasn't encouraged the, the, the participation of the student representatives. And so what the student representatives role has become on the board has been one more of providing an activity report, which is great because it helps us keep informed as to what's going on at the high schools, but it really doesn't give us what I would like to see from the student board rep's role, which is their ideas and thoughts about the issues that the board is dealing with. The students, you know, have a lot of ideas. You know, when we're talking about cell phone policy, 
we've never been in classrooms with cell phones, right? We grew up and there were no cell phones in classrooms. However, the students, that's a, a, a you know, reality of everyday life for them. So they understand both the pros and the cons of cell phones in the classrooms. And I really wish that our student board representatives, at whatever level we have them, would participate more both in the discussion and also by informing us with their preference votes. Thank you, Megan. I think it's a great idea. I mean, why not have um, more representation from students who are actually at the schools every day? Um, as far as the high school students go, we do have one representative from each of the high schools, and so maybe we could have some sort of rotation with one student from each of the uh, middle schools and one student from each of the elementary schools. I think that they could give us a lot of advice and feedback on things that are important especially in regards to mental health programs, bullying, um, where do they actually see the problems? And so uh, principals are great. Obviously, they, they give us a lot of feedback, but I think hearing it from the students is what is most important. And so whether that's uh, giving students a site survey at each elementary school and a site survey at each of the middle schools, how safe are you feeling at your school? Um, uh, let's see, at the high schools, they added um, some counselors to help with their mental health um, issue. And so are students using those resources? Is it helping? And so I think it is important to hear from each of the students. They're never too young uh, to give advice. And so I think it would be good to have some sort of rotation with them like we do the high school students. Thank you. Jeannie. Actually, I really like the idea of having more participation from our student body because I think sometimes as adults, we think we know what's happening and we really don't. So it's really nice to have that input. Um, and I love, I've gone to board meetings and I love to hear what the high school students say and give reports. And I do think it'd be nice to have them give more ideas and have more input. The only thing I would caution is sometimes the board meetings can get a little heated. <laughs> so I would be, I would, Caution that maybe a, a, as an elementary student, um, they they st you know they might want to leave a little early if we know that some topic is coming up that we they don't need to see or talk about. So that's the only thing I'd probably caution about. Um, but I would love to see them happen because I think the more participation and the more involvement we have at every grade level, that's what's really going to make our school much more special. Thank you, Matt. I think it's a wonderful idea. Uh, the board needs to become inclusionary. We need to listen to the voice of parents. We need to listen to the voice of students. And we need to share ideas. We are all trying to accomplish the same thing. So let's hear from everybody. And I think that having students participate in this is another form of education. Those students who are coming, they're learning how government works. So any opportunity that we have to inform to create opportunities to further learning are positive. So I fully support the idea of having the inclusion of the students. Thank you. Okay, we're gonna start this question with Megan. Do you represent any special interests? And if so, who? I don't represent any special interests. Um, I represent the voice of the students. Um, I'm their voice, and whatever decisions I make as a board member are going to put students first. Um, as a teacher, like I've already said, I'm in the classroom daily, and so I know what, it, I know what students and teachers need to succeed. Um, I want to be a teacher voice, but I also want to be a student voice. I'm an independent thinker. I make decisions on my own. I evaluate all uh, pros and cons of a situation. And like I stated before, what decisions, uh, or what decisions we make are going to affect which stakeholders. Obviously, I'm one vote out of five people, but I'm going to state my opinion, and no one is going to tell me what to do. Uh, so I think it is important to, to know that. Um, so the short answer is no, I, I'm not representing any special interests. Thank you. Jeannie. Um, no, I'm not representing any special interests. Um, anybody who knows me knows I'm a very independent speaker, thinker. I, I'm very honest and I'm straightforward. One of the things I love about what I'm looking forward to sitting on the board is actually having really great discourse with my fellow board members to talk about ideas. But it's also important that we all have a board members who are diverse and who bring different perspectives, and that's really important. 
But no, I, I don't represent any special interests. I represent, I, I represent the kids and the parents and the district as a whole, because those are the most important people. Thank you. Matt. No, I don't represent any special interest. I would like to represent the community. That's what we're here for. We're here for your students. We're here for the people who have had students who have passed, and we're even here for those who don't have students in our district. We are here for the community and nothing else. Thank you. Rick? No. Short answer, okay. <laughs> All right, we're gonna start the next, are you, that's it, right, okay? <laughs> Didn't want to cut you off. <laughs> okay, we're gonna start with Jeannie on this question. What do you believe can be improved by re a reconfigured school board and some new faces? Oh, so much, when you look <laughs> When you look at the school board and you talk about, when they do research about what happens with the school board, one of the things they talk about is when a school board works together well. They can move programs forward. They can work collaboratively together. And that's when you see changes in the school district. We are lucky because right now we have a new superintendent and we have the possibility of having a new, almost a whole new board. And that is really amazing to be able to work with a superintendent and to work with people and work well together and to be able to talk and to move on and not be caught up in things, but to really listen to the voice of the community and make decisions based on what's really the best choices for the kids and the district and the parents and the community. That's what's really important. So yes, I'm excited about the new school board. I'm excited about the new superintendent and I'm really excited about where we could be headed as a school, as a school district in the future. Thank you. Matt. I am thrilled with the idea of a new board. And when you look around, the world changes. Things change, and we need to change with it. We need to have a board that includes the thoughts of the community. We need to rely on the community. We need to seek their advice. Uh, we don't want to operate in a vacuum. And I think that you know, of all the, the candidates up here, I would be happy to work with any of them. They all bring something unique to the table. And the members who are still on the board uh, are wonderful as well. So I am really looking forward to a new culture on the board that is inclusionary, it's transparent, and we can rebuild the trust of the public. Thank you. Rick. I, I think some turnover is healthy on a board. Uh, I mean, I think it's, you know, in this election, a majority of the board's up, which is, you know, unusual. It happens every other election cycle. Um, but it's clear that the board could use some new blood, both from the standpoint of uh, new ideas and invigoration. It's also true that we are going through a leadership transition uh, and that after this election, there will be nobody on the board that selected the prior superintendent. It'll be a, a new board. And so that's part of, I think, the process of us transitioning to lead, new leadership under uh, the new superintendent. Uh, you know, board turnover is good. Even the, the one thing that worries me about um, turnover in this cycle is that we're going to have a relatively inexperienced board. We're losing our two longest tenured members who've served the district well, and Tony Colados, who's been on the board for nine years, and Barbara Lucky, who's been on the board for 21 years. So we're, we're losing a lot of historical knowledge. Um, but, you know, board turnover is good, and I look forward to, if elected, you know, to working with whoever else is elected at this table, as well as my two current colleagues who will remain on the board. Thank you. Megan. Can you repeat the question one more time? Sure. Yes. What do you believe can be improved by a reconfigured school board and some new faces? So I think that there's always room to improve. Um, as a teacher, I reflect uh, consistently in my classroom to see what I can do differently to help students. And so I think that there's always room for improvement. Um, definitely what, everything, what everyone else has mentioned about diversity. Um, we will get a diverse amount of knowledge um, with any of us being elected, um, especially me being a product of the district and being a current teacher. 
Um, that is a perspective that I don't know that we've had, or maybe it's been a while. Um, there is a difference between being a current teacher versus retired. Um, we have different opinions and things, but I think it is uh, something that is important. I am excited to work with the superintendent as well. Um, he seems really great. He's came, he, come from, he came from uh, a high achieving district too, and I'm excited with the goals uh, that he put out last night at last night's board meeting. Um, some things that we really do need to be concerned about uh, uh, right now are student mental health and uh, student safety and just health in general. And so um, I think that is important for us to focus on. Um, next year there is going to be an implementation of a new health curriculum in the state of California. And so as a board, we need to figure out where are we gonna teach health uh, to make sure that students are physically safe, especially with um, some potential drug issues that are going on. So that's something that's important too. Okay, thank you. All right, we're gonna start with Matt on this question. How will you improve the quality of nutrition offered to our children? Uh, that is a terrific question. Uh, during my, my 17 school tour, I did stop at the, the lunch counter and it was corn dogs and tater tots and not quite what our students need. Uh, but one of the wonderful programs we do have is the salad bar. And there's salad, fresh salad, fresh fruit. And you know, I spoke to the, I'm sorry, I'm gonna just call her the lunch lady, and she said that they're well used, that the students actually take advantage of that cart quite often. Uh, I would love for us to investigate uh, how we can improve the quality of our food and to really promote healthy eating in our district. Okay, thank you. Rick. Yeah, I think food quality has always been an issue at any campus, whether you're talking elementary through college. Uh, so it, it, it is something hard to do in terms of, um, you know, the quantities of people wanting lots of nutritious food at the same time. One of the things that I think we could do better is that instead of only buying from institutional kinds of vendors, we could buy from local vendors. You know, there's plenty of local sandwich shops, for example, that are happy to make nutritious sandwiches that both the parents and the kids would feel are appropriate for those kids. And so I'd like to see us do more partnerships with local vendors as opposed to national chains and national institutional food service vendors uh, to provide the meals to our kids and basically options. I, I would like to, there to be more options also for the kids and the parents to choose from. Thank you, Megan. So that's one of the issues too that I'm really concerned about is student physical health. So not just mental, but physical too. So making sure that our students are physically active and are eating the, uh, the best foods that we can. Um, I think that that's a great idea that Rick stated with uh, foods from local vendors. I do know that a lot of our schools have school uh, gardens. And so I think that they, um, they do need to be improved and increased throughout our school sites. And so I think it's happening a little bit right now, but wouldn't it be great if we had um, a big garden at each school site and we actually use the food that we grew um, in a salad bar or something like that? I think that that is something to look at. Uh, the students would be proud of that and they can see where food comes from and they're actually eating it. Um, I do have a garden outside my school site right now. I partnered with a teacher last year and we got an education grant um, from Redondo Beach Ed Foundation. And so the students were so excited to see the food that we were growing and they were tasting tomatoes um, and, and everything. And so I think that would be great if all school sites had that and we can kind of incorporate that into our uh, lunch program somehow. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, as a mother, lunch is always a problem. It's always one of the things we struggle with. Um, and my daughter, both of my kids have a lot of allergies and that's one thing I'm very concerned about. So I would really love it if we could, talk, um, when I went to a school, I saw a board that had what they had served and then they had the allergy check so that kids knew when they could pick food what the allergens were in. That's one of the things I would love to see in our school district, to work with the kids with more allergies. Um, you know, I would love the idea to have more choices, because you know, when a kid sees the same thing, because actually when you go online, you can see the menu for a month, what's happening, and that's one of the things you could talk to your kids about and show them what's happening. 
But at the same time, sometimes I've gone to school and I've seen the kids go like, eh, and then eh, and the trash can, right? It goes one to another, or they pick one or two things. And I think we have to work on giving the kids choices, a variety. Our kids, um, a lot of our kids have very sophisticated taste buds now. And I don't think we should be scared to sh sh introduce different types of food uh, into their into the lunch program to give them a chance. We do have gardens in our school district, and I know that when they harvest it, they do, um, like I know Soliata, when they harvest their garden, they sell it, and they sell the, uh, uh, the produce, and that's really wonderful. But we need to have more choices and different variety, and to also look at al um, how to work into allergens. Thank you. Okay, everybody answered that, right? Yes, okay. We're gonna start with Rick on this question. Being on the school board requires flexibility in schedules to meet and attend site events at all hours, sorry. Can you discuss your availability to attend meetings in the morning, afternoon, and evenings? So that, that's one of the advantages of being uh, semi-retired is that I'm much more in control of my schedule than, than many other people. Um, you know, one of the things that I made it a point to do when I got appointed to the board last year was that I did go to each of the school sites. My, my school site visits take uh, approximately two hours. I spend an hour with the principal and then I spend an hour going to virtually every classroom on that campus and seeing how things are with the teachers and the kids and, and observing what's good and bad at each site. Um, I've started that tour this year. I started with the elementary schools this year and, and so far um, started with Lunata Bay and I'm scheduled for Cornerstone tomorrow. Plan to get through all 16 sites uh, by the end of um, the, uh, this, this, this calendar year. Um, and you know, I, I have great availability, and I think that that's important. I think that there is, well, there's no way to really do the job unless you're able to go to the sites during the time that the kids are there. If you're not able to do that, you don't understand some of the issues that are occurring on the sites. You have to be able to interact with parents when they're available. You have to be able to respond to their issues, investigate their complaints, and come up with solutions. Also, when we were selecting a new superintendent, that required a ton of special meetings that we had morning, afternoon, and night, depending on the particular day. And so I think that the scheduling flexibility is important and the availability to do the job. It's really a half-time job. Thank you. Megan, your availability. So yes, I am a teacher. I do have a full-time job, right? But that does not limit me or hinder me in being a great board member. I think it is important that we do have a diversity on our board, and so some of those people should be working full-time, right? I think that I think that's something that's important. Um, as far as flexibility, like any other job, I do have my, my annual days each year, and so I am committed um, to doing whatever is needed on this board, right? So um, I will take time off when needed. It is important to go to the school sites like everyone has been saying. I have been visiting them as well. And so I think that uh, any issues that arise, um, I will make sure that they are addressed. I deal with parents all the time and I get back to them efficiently as a teacher. And so um, I think that we shouldn't be asking the question, what's what are people's availability? I think um, what are people going to do to make sure that these issues get addressed? And like I said, um, I will make sure that I get to the school sites and attend all board meetings when needed. Um, I will make sure that that happens. Thank you. Jeannie. Um, well, one of the reasons I decide to drive, I mean, to run right now is my daughter's on the verge of driving, which as you know, gives me a lot of freedom. So <laughs> that's really great. Um, I do think it's important to meet parents at times because there's emergencies that come up at school sites and that we need to respond to as board members. And so I would say that it, I'm available, I wanna meet parents, I wanna talk to them, I wanna, it's important because it is a part-time job. I know it's supposed to be somewhat of a volunteer, but it is a part-time job. And you, when you decide to run for board, you have to make that commitment that there is gonna be times that you have to put this first. Um, Wednesday night, I've been going to board meetings. I 
give my daughter dinner, and I said, I'll see you later, and I take off and I go to the board meetings. I, when, I go to su uh, when I go see the um, school sites, I make sure I schedule the time when my kids are in school, but at the same time, I also have a husband who's very supportive of me, and you have to have a spouse when you have children that could work together with you. And I have that, and I'm very fortunate. And I also have friends who I could call if I need transportation or I need help. And that it takes, it takes a village to raise everybody else's kids. And, and to have that support is really important. Thank you, Matt. Uh, as a small business owner, um, I have a very flexible time in when I actually need to work. Um, I'm fortunate that um, my income is pale in comparison to my wife's. And so it allows me a lot of flexibility to spend I, you know, I'm telling the truth here, and she's sitting back there, she's probably gonna yell at me when I get home. Um, but it, it gives me an opportunity. Uh, for the school tours, I sent Jenna an email, I said for the next two weeks, schedule me all the schools that you can. And she did, and whatever time she gave me, I wanted to be respectful of the principal's time, and I accepted it. I worked it around my schedule so I could visit every school and talk to every principal. And. Being able to see what's going on at school during the day, to see how teachers are interacting with their students, it's amazing, I mean, to, to witness what we have in our learning and our programs and how they're utilizing it with flexible seating. Uh, unless you're actually there watching it, uh, you're missing out. And when you walk around with the principal in elementary school, it's like walking around with a rock star. <laughs> Everybody's sure. like, hi, hi, hi. And it's like, wow. And so. Um, it's that experience. It is that opportunity to see exactly what's going on when it is happening that is critical. Thank you. Okay, the next question, we'll start with Megan. All right, do you have special interests? In other words, special needs, athletics, arts, things like that. Do, not do you represent any special interests? But do you have special kind of academic interests or, or extracurricular interests that you want to focus on? Special needs, athletic, student interests. Yes, absolutely. Sorry. <laughs> I'm just reading it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, well, I, I think that I have a lot of ideas. Um, I already stated them before. Uh, focusing on mental health for students, uh, student safety, um, environmental programs, community partnership. Um, also, the arts programs are very important to our schools. Um, it's important to not only focus on academics and books, but uh, we need to make sure that we are uh, making the whole child successful. And so that's a great thing too about Redondo is that we do focus on the whole child education. And that's what I would like to, uh, to improve and continue to see in Palos Verdes. Uh, so arts programs are definitely important. Language programs like Jeannie stated, language in the elementary schools, I remember when I was in fourth grade, uh, I did take Spanish about once or twice a week before school started with one of the teachers. And it's unfortunate to hear that that's not happening anymore. And so language is so important, especially at an early age. And so language, uh, arts, sports, music, I think that everything is important, not just the books. And so those are some things I'm passionate about. And of course, I want to hear from the community. Um, you are actually involved in it and your children are involved. And so I want to hear from you on anything else that is important to you. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, as you know, I'm very interested in mental health and I'm also interested in bringing back her world language back to elementary schools. We used to have it when my daughter was in kindergarten and it was really nice to have. And also AVID back to the middle schools. I would love to see the AVID program back. It's, it's not there anymore. Um, and also safety, just safety, what I mean safety, I mean bullying, uh, the facilities to be safe, a lot of those kind of issues. And also what I call anchor programs. Anchor programs are programs that our kids can join like clubs to make sure they have some place where they feel connected to, where they feel like they have friends or adult that can oversee what they're doing. It's important, especially with our budget cuts and how our base funding is so low, that we make sure that we have these type of programs for our kids, because if we don't, then these kids are gonna drift. And we need to look at that. Um, 
Because when a kid feels like there's nothing holding them down, then that's we're gonna start seeing problems. Then we're gonna start seeing increase in drug use. And we have to have those programs. And you know what I would love to do is I've been on the community and I've met so many wonderful people who want to give back, who want to do something for our district and somehow connect with them. And I want to reach out to them because we have a community of people who no longer have children in the district who want to come back and help out. And that's one thing I want to connect with. Thank you. Matt. I agree that mental health is probably the program I want to focus on the most. Uh, when you look at our high school students, one in four are depressed, one in five have seriously contemplated suicide. Not just a thought, a passing thought, but seriously contemplated it. Uh, we can't have that. And unfortunately, it's not just endemic of our hill. It is a national problem. And so our programs, we need to be able to help our students, as Jeannie said, to find other outlets, to find other activities, to find things that they can grab onto when one thing falls. And to do this, you know, we really need the cooperation of the parents. We need to be able to reach the parents and allow the parents the tools that they have, knowing that things have changed, our students are in danger, and we need to help them. One other thing that I would really love to see would be the continuity of programs. We have so many wonderful programs up here, and oftentimes they are led by one person. And when that person leaves, the program dies. So as a district, we need to like make sure that we are training somebody to take over the program when they leave. A program that only exists for six months or three years it's not an effective program. These programs take time, and they're worth it. Okay, thank you. Rick. So, so one of the things that I really feel is really important is that we offer essentially a program for every kid and every level kid that allows them to get to their highest achievement level. Um, we actually do, I think, a pretty good job of that at the high school, and that's where you see those cho choices open up. Uh, and that you have something for that kid who may not be college bound, may, may just aspire to a career, to somebody that's you know, looking to be a PhD and a world class researcher. Uh, and so I think it's important to have all those tracks from CTE, regular ed, honors, AP, and have that available. The other thing that I like about the high school culture is that there is just a plethora of clubs and interests. If you want to, are interested in something that exists, you can join a club of like-minded people. And I think that that's really important to the kids' social and emotional well-being is that they find their pot of kids that are like them and that they can feel that they belong to. And if you have an interest that there isn't a club around, you can start one. And I think our, our district is really supportive of that, and I think that that's important. Um, I do think that it's important to take advantage of the community's expertise. And for example, there's a Korean teacher who's going out for a conference. And so we've reached out now um, to the Korean community to have uh, somebody come in to help the substitute teacher so that we can take advantage of their domain expertise so that we have a substitute teacher who doesn't know anything about Korean, but that we can supplement them with a community member who actually can speak Korean. So I think that, that it's really good to involve the community that way. And there's a lot of other ideas that I've proposed from the board table in terms of improving the district that way. Thank you. Okay, this question will start with Jeannie. PVPUSD's teacher salary schedule and benefits are lower than a number of surrounding districts. Do you believe this is an issue? And if so, how would you address it? But thank you for giving me the easy one first. <laughs> yeah, I appreciate My that. Pleasure. <laughs> um, uh, you know, this is a tough question. I think we all value teachers. We all think that we want to pay our teachers a fair sum of money because it's important. Because in order to attract and keep quality teachers, we have to give them pay. We have to pay them a fair wage. There's not too many places where you just give them 1% increase and we're gonna have people stay. It's a very complicated uh, issue that we have. And I would want our teachers to feel like they're valued. I think that's even more important than the salary. Well, I wouldn't say that, sorry. I think the salary is very important, but I think our teachers really need to feel like they're valued and respected in our community. 
And that's really, I think, the heart of the matter that's been happening for the last couple of years with the teachers and the district, is they've been feeling undervalued and not respected. So it's, it's not just an issue of money, I think, it's an issue of how they feel in our district. And of course, we want to pay our teachers what we can. We want to pay them a fair salary. You know, I've talked to the teachers about the benefit package, and if you've ever seen the benefit package they have, it's not good. It is not good to package, and we have to fix that. We have to work with that, because if you work for a company and any other company that had this benefit package, I think you'd be a little concerned. Hmm. But I think the heart of the matter, it's two things. One is we need to make sure our teachers feel respected and valued, and the other is to really do pay them a fair salary. But we also are limited within our budget constraints sometimes. Thank you. Matt. So do teachers deserve a raise? Absolutely. We have great teachers and we want to keep them. But it's not that simple. We have a lot of other issues in our district that we need to focus on. We have overcrowding in classrooms. My daughter's Spanish class, for example, has 38 students in it. How do you teach with 38 students? So what we need to do is we need to look at how we can save money. Where can we cut costs? If we are asking our teachers to sacrifice, we need to sacrifice ourselves as a district. We need to make sure that every dollar is going where it should go, and it should go to the teachers. We need to make sure, however, that we have the money. And it's, it's kind of scary when you say a 1% increase you know, it doesn't sound like very much, but when you add in the benefits, that's $900,000, that's a million dollars. And that million dollars, well, Rick, sorry, there goes our, our balanced budget. It doesn't mean they don't deserve it. It means that we need to work together with them. We need to cut costs before we can do anything else. And as much as I would love to give them a raise at this point, I hope that they can understand that we are working on it that that's what we want for them, and that they'll learn to trust us, that we are doing everything we can for them. Thank you, Rick. So I'm, I'm a lot more constrained in how I can answer this okay. question uh, compared to others, uh, given that we're currently in negotiations with the teachers union. Um, but it, it's, uh, you know, teachers in our district are great. You know, the vast majority of the teachers are excellent. They do a great job and they care deeply about their students. They deserve to be respected. They deserve to be treated fairly. That said, the vast majority of our budget, 83% goes to personnel. And the vast majority of that goes to teachers. And so if you're gonna give a raise to teachers, you have to find a way to adjust the budget to not break the budget, right? Because we're in balance now, we don't want to get out of balance. And so there's two ways to do that. You know, one is to raise revenues, and that would be great. And we ought to be trying to raise revenues, and that would provide more money for all things in the district, including teacher salaries. One of the things that I'm looking forward to is hearing the Budget Advisory com Committee's recommendations in terms of actually how we might both raise revenues and potentially reprioritize some of the expenditures. It's a great thing that we have a Budget Advisory co Committee now in the district for the first time. The district also has on that committee representation from both the teachers union and the classified employees union. So it's an inclusive committee and I look forward to hearing the recommendations. Thank you, Megan. So I think that there is a problem with education in general in California and the United States. We don't put enough of our funds into education. And so that's a state level, um, that's a national level. And so PV is not the only one who is dealing with um, teacher salaries. And so of course, they deserve to be paid more. Um, they work very hard and their goal is to help as many students as possible. 
yes, there are neighboring districts who pay more. And so that is something to look at uh, within our finances. Um, but like people have stated, we do have to see where can we cut costs or where can we increase revenue. And so one way, one major way to increase revenue is to increase the number of students that we have so that we can get more funds. Um, at the same time, if we are increasing students, we'll probably need to increase teachers as well. It's unfortunate to hear about the class size of 38 that Matt mentioned. They're definitely not learning the best that they can in there. Um, I can attest to that being a teacher. That's crazy to me. And so I think that teachers would also agree that uh, smaller class sizes are important to them, as well as better salaries and benefits. I think the main thing that I would bring is being a mediator to the district, because I am a teacher, so I can see both sides. I see what you need and what you want, and what funds do we have? And so I think that I would be a great mediator, and let's see where we can come together and improve our relationship um, that really hasn't been that way over the past few years. Great. Thank you. All right, this question will start with Matt. In the last two years, what community service or activities have you been involved with with the PVP schools? I was the fourth VP for the PTA, and the, the fourth VP is in charge of school safety, and that started about three years ago when we had a lockdown situation at Montemalaga. And the way the drill was handled, they weren't prepared. The district had not prepared them. Uh, so I went to a community forum, and we were talking about it, and they said, hey, you seem to know what you're talking about. You know, why don't you become our fourth VP? So I did. And working with them, you know, we were able to uh, get blinds installed at our school to increase our safety. Uh, I was able to work with them on budgets, work with them on a ton of terrific and fun projects. Um, and then it was last year that our parking situation at the school was getting out of control. It was getting dangerous. We had students walking between cars that were parked, uh, waiting for drop off. Uh, they were crossing through the parking lot. There were lines. There was confusion. And we reached out, you know, what can we do? But there were no funds. There wasn't any money. We, there was nothing we could do about it. So I grabbed a pair of Mickey Mouse gloves and a yellow vest. And morning and afternoon, I stood out there directing traffic just to keep our students safe. And that's the same kind of enthusiasm and dedication I want to bring to the board to do whatever I can to do what's best for our students. Thank you. Rick. Sure. I, I've spent really, um, you know, the whole time that our kids were in school volunteering along with my wife, Allison. Uh, I was on PEF for nine years until 2017. Since then, I took, uh, I don't know, eight months off before I came onto the school board. So that, that's pretty continuous. Uh, prior to that, I was the financial secretary for the Athletic Booster Club. Uh, for three years. Um, for those that don't know, I announced the football games at one of our high schools uh, and still do that and have done that for about nine years now. Uh, and one of the things that I enjoy the most is that I get to judge the science fair um, because we have some amazing kids in this district and I really like you know, interacting with them and seeing the projects and the amazing work that they do. I look forward to seeing the projects every spring. Thank you, Megan. So during my student teaching experience, I was fortunate enough to volunteer and student teach at Soleado Elementary School under Carrie Ellis, who's actually one of our PV teachers of the year. And so I did my student teaching experience in fifth grade with language arts and social studies with her. And that was a great um, experience that I had with her. I think what's important to focus on is uh, looking towards the future and not going back in the past. Um, I am a product of the district, like I said, and so I want to make sure that I give back to my community that gave me so much. And so if elected as a board member, I'm very excited to uh, continue to volunteer and make our schools great. And so I look forward to the next chapter. Um, and so, like I said, going through the school system, I don't think that there's any, uh, there's any, um, uh, what's the word, uh, ex not excuse, but I don't think there's any replacement for that, right? And so being a volunteer is one thing, 
but actually going through the schools myself, I think that's invaluable. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, I've done everything from being room mom to chairing the talent show reflection program. I've also been fourth VP, so I really understand safety at the school level. Um, I've also been sixth VP, seventh VP, a PTA. I've, I've done everything. Um, lately, right now, my husband and I are the STEM mentors for the robotics team at Peninsula High School. And that came about where I was being the, the mentor at robotics and my daughter's on the robotics team. And I thought, hey, we could do more with this. So what happened is we decided to do a STEM camp. So last year we started STEM camp with a Soli Auto. Uh, kids and this year we are including Silver Spur, uh, Point Vicente, and Soli Auto in our STEM camp. So I'm always looking for new ways to volunteer or new ways to make connections in the community because I think it's wonderful when the high school students could teach the younger kids. So I've done a lot. I've also, as I said before, chaired the air condition uh, task force at Ridgecrest, and I've also volunteered and um, spearheaded the. Uh, non-toxic cleaning products at our school district. And you know what, I'm looking forward to doing even more. It's gonna, it's, you know what, volunteering at school is a lot of fun and you get to hang out with your kids and they want to hang out with you, which is really cool. Thank you. Okay, the next question will start with Rick. How do you build consensus when the individuals on the board are all independent thinkers? You let them think independently first <laughs> and put their ideas out. And I, and I think that, um, you know, what's interesting about being on a school board as opposed to, um, you know, a, if you're just running a company is that you've got this thing called the Brown Act, right? And the Brown Act requires meetings in open. And so that requires discussions in open. And that requires the there actually are gonna be disagreements in open, right? And that's the way the Brown Act is supposed to work, is that everybody's supposed to get their ideas out, and that then when you're at the table, the public can see how the board moved towards consensus. That, you know, there, everybody's got, nobody's got all the answers, right? Everybody's got a, a point of view that is valid and has something to contribute. And what you have to figure out is a way to move the group of five together to an opinion that everybody can get behind and that, that it makes the most sense for the students and not just for the individual board members' interests. And you know, one of the problems that, um, that there's been is that, yes, the, the, the job of the board is to select the superintendent and frequently um, you know, just ratify um, many of, of management's decisions because th that is kind of how the board functions, right? Th there's just so much that goes on at the district that has to come through the board for final approval that we're not gonna check every I and dot every T on a contract. But we have to also have times where the board thinks independently and decides what's best for the students in the opinion of the board as a whole. Thank you. Megan, same question. Independent thinkers. <laughs> so uh, who wouldn't want to have independent thinkers, right? Everyone should be. You don't want um, someone kind of feeding you information and telling you what to do. Um, but with that being said, like Rick said, of course you want to think over everything independently and then work with your colleagues and collaborate to come to the best decision for students. As a teacher, I collaborate often, uh, daily, weekly, and so I'm a team of six. Um, there are six math, uh, six, sixth grade math and science teachers, and so we collaborate weekly, if not more, to make sure that we have common assessments, that we have essential standards, we have learning targets for our students, and so we work together to think um, what assessments we think would be best for students, how to word things, and so I might think something, my colleague has another answer, and so I could say, you know what, that's a great idea, I didn't think of it that way, or you're right, we should change that. But we all want to come to the table with our own expertise, our own knowledge, our own independent thinking, and then of course, coming together to collaborate, share ideas. We don't know everything, and so my expertise and background is in education, so I might defer uh, to someone else who has some sort of other experience that I may behind, be behind a little bit. And so independent thinking first, 
collaborate together to make the best decisions for our students. Thank you, Jeannie. You know, I think there's a reason why there's five people on the board because we wanna make sure that different ideas come and that decisions are made with knowledge from different people. And I want independent thinkers. I want there to be discourse. But at the end of the day, I think you have to make decisions based on what's best for the students in the district. And that's really important. And you have to trust that the board member, the person sitting next to you is also has the same values and is thinking the same way. And, and just that talk and to have that relationship because I think it's really important to have that trust between board members also to know that there's nothing behind their decision, nothing that's um, making them have the, this discussion, but to have that trust also that, that they, have, they, they, they have the heart of what's best in the district. And we should have discourse, we should, because you know what? If we don't and we all agree on everything, then there's something wrong with that too. So how do you get, you know, we're not always gonna agree on stuff. Sometimes there'll be two of us who agree and three, and that's okay. And that's how it should be. And because you know what, we're all adults, and I think that's really important that we have those kind of discussions. Thank you, Matt. I have to agree with what Jeannie said, that we have to be able to trust each other. And we have to set a goal. We have to set goals for the board, and we have to analyze that everything that we are doing is working towards those goals. Uh, recently, the board was asked um, how many of them could name uh, the goals of the district, and unfortunately, they couldn't. And that's a problem. How can you work together if you don't know what you're working together for? Now, with collaboration, it is important that you hear the other ideas. Um, I actually love it when my ideas are challenged. You know, I can have an idea that I think is wonderful and somebody looks at me like, you are crazy. And you know what, sometimes I am, and that's okay. But you have to be able to question. You have to feel free to exercise your thought. And that is how we can build this district into one of the best districts in the state, if not the best district in the state. It's by listening to each other and working together. Okay, thank you. Okay, we'll start with Megan on this question. How can we improve our policy on bullying and what could be done if it's not bullying but an actual fight? Well, I think it is important to take a look at, at our district policy in regards to bullying um, and make sure that we do have one in place when instances uh, arise. And so I know that there was an issue recently. I'm not on the board. Um, I'm not fully familiar with the situation, but I have read some articles about it. And so it seems like maybe this happened multiple times. And if that is the case, um, that's not acceptable. All students need to feel safe in whatever environment or school that they're in. And so I think it's important to do a survey, kind of like I said before, with students at all elementary, middle, and high schools. How safe are you feeling? And if you're not feeling uh, safe, why is that? Um, let's actually ask the students, why do you not feel safe? And so with that feedback from them, and obviously hearing from principals on what they think are some of the issues, then we can deal with it too. Um, unfortunately, I don't think it, I, I know it doesn't happen just in Palos Verdes, it unfortunately happens at other school sites too. Um, something I've done as a teacher is, I ask students to write a note card for me saying I wish my teacher knew and several students did come forward uh, and write on their note card that they were being bullied. They didn't feel comfortable telling me in person but they wanted to write it down and so once I figured out about the situation, I talked to counselors, administrators, other students to try to handle the problem as best uh, as I could and so um, it is something that's greatly important. We need to have a district-wide policy and talk to the students about how are they feeling and how can we fix it? Great, thank you. Jeannie. Um, actually, we do have a district-wide policy on bullying. I have it right here. Um, I think the most important thing is we have to hold people accountable. If there's a policy, we enforce the policy. It's just that simple. If we have, um, it's, when a kid is being bullied and they come to an adult, they're saying something. They're saying, I need help, please help me. And as adults, we need to listen to that. 
And we need to say, we're here to help you. Bullying, when I saw that video, I'm sure a lot of you have seen that video that was on television. One of the things that struck me was the fact that the kids are filming. Other kids are filming it, and it happens. And we have to attack that. We have to address that issue also. My daughter tells me about fights at school. She tells me what happens. And she said, the kids stand around and film it. And then they show it to each other in class. And she said, I'm sure the teachers see it, Mom. I don't know what to do. And I said, we need to hold people accountable, and we need to follow policy. If there's a policy in place, we follow it. And if they don't know the policy, then we make sure they understand the policy. And when a kid asks for help, we give them help, because that's really important. Thank you. Matt. Uh, so bullying I hold very near to my own heart. Um, and bullying in any form is damaging to a child. It causes a lifetime of pain and anxiety. I was bullied constantly in junior high school, and I still feel the effects today. So anytime I hear that a student is bullied, it really goes down to my core that we need to do something about it. And one of the things that we need to do is we need to make sure that our yard staff that is out there during recess, that our janitors, that anybody who, has, who sets foot on the campus is trained in how to identify and how to handle bullying incidents. We also need to define exactly what bullying is. Bullying, by definition, is continual harassment. I don't think that goes far enough. I think that we need to look at even, you know, single acts can be considered bullying when they embarrass, humiliate, degenerate. We need to stop it. And we need to do that by having better educate, not even better educated. What we need to do is we need to give the people who are on campus the skills that they are able to use to address the issue. Students who feel safe, who feel supported, and who feel cared for are gonna learn so much faster and so much quicker than if they're worried about what's gonna happen to them at recess. Thank you. Rick? So unfortunately, bullying and fighting are age-old problems on school campuses. That doesn't mean that they're not serious. I'd like to think that the incidences of bullying and fighting have gone down. I'm not sure that they have. But what we need to do is do a better job with our kids. We don't teach our kids well enough that when they see an incident of somebody being bullied, regardless of whether or not they're a friend of that kid, they should stick up for the kid that's being bullied. That's the side that they should be on. They shouldn't admire the bully-er, the kid who's demonstrating power and is the popular kid. That's not the type of behavior that we should be trying to encourage in our kids. We also need to encourage our kids that when they see bullying, they feel bullied, they know something is wrong, to go to an adult on campus. And we need to hold the adults on campus for taking accountable for taking the proper actions. And I think our adults on campus in general do a good job of that. That when they're aware of a situation that they will take the appropriate actions. When there is discipline to be meted out, there is appropriate progressive discipline that is meted out to, to the offenders. But it's really important that we work with the kids so that they understand that they have the tools themselves to deal with bullying and how to deal with it when they either are involved in it or observe it. Thank you. Okay, the next question will start with Jeannie. What is the most important responsibility of a school board equal to selecting the right superintendent? So. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, you just, that was my answer. Yeah. <laughs> so I, don't, I have nothing now. Okay, um, I think we talked about having goals and having clear goals, understanding what the goals of the district are. Um, and to follow those goals, and also to look to the future and to have a vision of what our school district should be. And to also work together as a board to make sure those goals and those programs go forward. Those are important things. And also to build relationships in the community, listen to parents, listen to teachers, and listen to kids, and to understand the core values of what our community is about. And you know, when I talk to 
when I, when I went out and I talked to people in the community, one of the things I noticed is they, they always ask me, what is happening in the school district? And I think one of the jobs as the Board of Education is to make sure that we communicate to everyone, whether you have kids or not kids in the district. Those are, those are really important things that we can work on. And also to work together with the superintendent and with the district to make sure that we push forward programs that will benefit all our students and all our staff. Okay, thank you. Matt. So the role of the school board is to work as partners with educators, part with parents and the community to make our district the best that it can be. It is to advocate for our district and it's to advocate for our children. It is to reach out for sources of funding. It is to look for every opportunity we can to increase revenue and every opportunity we have to decrease expenses. It is the responsibility of the board to make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can for the student. Okay, very good. Um, Rick? So the role of the school board, I do think selecting the right superintendent is really important. Um, but, but I do think, you know, this, fundamentally the role of the school board is to represent you, the community. The whole purpose of having a school board is to have local control so that the education of our kids, the values that we instill in the kids, and the priorities that, that are reflected in the district in terms of how it applies its resources are determined by us here in Palos Verdes and not by Sacramento. And, and that's the fundamental thing. And you know, I think it's been good in this state that we've moved towards more local control by changing the funding formula to LCFF and also that we now have an LCAP, which is supposed to be the bridge between you know, the dollars that come into the district and the programs that they're spent on through the desires of, of the local um, board and community. I would encourage you all to participate in the development of the LCAP as that becomes a more meaningful document. The, the other role is really, um, it's a check and balance role, right? It is the board that represents the community and thus it is kind of the, the check and balance on the staff and the management of the district. And so in that sense, it's a check and balance. And finally, it is kind of a governance role in the terms of the policies that we set out. So that if there's a policy that needs to be addressed, for example, cell phones and classrooms, that we make a policy that we think is right for our kids in the community. Thank you. Megan. So besides hiring the superintendent, um, the main job of the school board is to represent the community and all important stakeholders. So this includes students, parents, teachers, other faculty, other members of our community who don't have uh, students in our schools, everyone matters. Everyone should care about how great our schools are, whether you have kids in the district or not. Um, and so it is important for us to keep our schools great and make fiscally responsible uh, decisions with anything that we make. Uh, it's also important to collaborate with each other and to collaborate with the superintendent um, in order to achieve the goals that uh, are set forward for the district. So like I said, the superintendent did set um, some goals last night, and so that's step one. And so, okay, now that we have these goals, what are some steps that we need to take to achieve those goals? And so working together as a board and with the superintendent, let's see what data can we collect, what steps can we do to implement those goals, and what if we don't meet those goals? What are we doing? How can we change? And so it's all an important reflection process in order to improve. But I think the main thing is that we're the voice of the students. And so everyone uh, has the same goal to represent students. And we need to make sure that, that they're our number one uh, responsibility with any choice that we make. Thank you. Okay, the next question we start with Matt. What is the present board doing well, what are they not doing well that you would change if you were on the board? Can I move away from Rick a little bit? <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, our board is doing some, some wonderful things. I mean, when you look around at our district, we have a wonderful district. There's no doubt. I mean, sure, we have our issues, and there are areas that we can improve but we owe a lot of what we have 
to the current board. They have done, they have worked tirelessly. You know, we do have a balanced budget, which uh, in June, it didn't look like that was gonna be possible. Uh, so they, they care and they work very hard for our students. And that's why I really respect the board that we have now. Uh, one of the things that as a board we can do better is to make sure that we are utilizing our resources. The parents on this hill are absolutely amazing. I mean, everybody in, in this room, I'm sure was at the top of their game or is at the top of their game. And we can use your help. When we have decisions that have to be made, do we need to run out to a consultant and pay them $30,000? Or can we have a committee that says, hey, take a look at this. Why don't you guys think about it this way? So as a board, we can be inclusionary. We can make sure that everybody is involved in the decision-making process, that everybody is contributing, and that we are taking full advantage of the resources we have on the Hill. Thank you. Rick. So, so one thing that I think we have on the current board, and I hope that the next board has, is I think there is zero doubt in any of the five board members' minds that their colleagues have anything but the best interests of the students at heart. And I think that that's really important. And while we may disagree on certain issues and certain implementations, there's no doubt that our motives are pure, at least in our minds. And I'm sure that, you know, with my, the potential candidates up here, that will be true on the new board as well. Um, I do think that 90% of the time, you know, we're a 5-0 board and agree um, and get it right. You know, 10% of the time, we're a little more stormy and uh, sometimes split. Um, and sometimes we could probably do a better job in working through uh, some of those uh, disagreements to try and get to 5-0. Um, I do also think that, um, you know, we, we make certain decisions as to how to manage the school board meetings. The school board meetings aren't public forums. They're, you know, working meetings of the board, but we don't necessarily do as good a job as I think in terms of listening to public comments and when they're, it's appropriate to, you know, refer some work on public comments, for example, to staff to do, which you're allowed to do. You're not allowed to discuss the public comment, but you are allowed to ask staff to follow up on it. We haven't chosen to do that. The next board may choose to do that. Um, I also think that we're not necessarily as open to the community on all the items as we should be. And, you know, I think that everyone up here has expressed uh, their desire, as of high, to involve the community more and hear the community input in the board's decision pro making process. Thank you. Megan. So overall, I think that the Board of Education has done a great job. Uh, currently, we do have two members, Anthony Colatis and Suzanne Seymour, who work and, and have jobs, and they're doing, uh, they're doing a great job with that. And so going back to that previous question, they have jobs and they're doing, they're doing a great job for, for our board. Um, but some areas to improve, I think a lot of what I've been hearing from, from people in the community is communication. So not just from the district level, but also school sites. And so we need to look at different ways that we can increase our communication with the community. Um, we need to listen to the community, get feedback from them on what they think is important too. And of course, transparency in everything that we do as well. Um, something that I would like to improve on the board is uh, creating an internship program with our high school, uh, our high schools and businesses and agencies in the community. And I think that would be a great idea so that students can experience a day in the life of some sort of career or have a more formal internship program that they're interested in. And so this would help students who want to go to college or maybe choose some other option. Uh, that's something that I think would be great to add to the board and have some sort of policy on that with our businesses, agencies, and local city governments and city councils too. But overall, they're doing a great job, but I think just communicating more, listening, and, and transparency. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, I actually think they did a good job picking a superintendent. So good job, guys, I have to say that. Um, I also am thankful that they balanced the budget. There were some very hard decisions they had to make, so I appreciate that they made that hard decision and that made that a priority, so thank you for that. Um, and, and I think that was really good. And I also th think that the board has done a good job also, of, like when I see them up there, I feel like they've done their work and they've done their research about a topic. 
And that is a lot of work, because if you ever see an agenda, it could be long, and sometimes it could be short, and there could be a lot of items. So that's one. Um, I wish they would do more community, when, more community input and can we get better communications with the, um, with the community as a whole. I think sometimes things happen or agenda items are happening and you know, people just don't know what's happening at the board meetings. I, I wish there would be a more proactive way of communicating with our community, also to get more community members involved with our school district. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll start with Rick on this question. In regards to decision making, do you prefer the voice of students or the voice of parents, and why? Uh, I, I think to quote a phrase common in the vernacular these days, all voices matter. <laughs> and so uh, I think that both parents and students have valid points of view, and they're different points of view on certain issues. Um, and you know, I think it also depends on the level. I mean, I do think that there's, uh, you know, a difference in terms of how you weight the elementary student's voice versus the high school student's voice. There's, a, you know, certainly a level of understanding and maturation, um, but certainly the elementary students have valid views as well. The parents, you know, especially those parents who are around the school campuses and, uh, you know, observe what's going on, they have a lot of valid things to say. And as I mentioned earlier, I think that um, you know one of the things that we could do better at the board level is actually engage our student members to actually voice their opinions on the issues that are being discussed that affect them in the classrooms and actually uh, ask them to cast their preference votes so that we know where they stand on the issues. Okay, thank you, Megan. I think that all voices are important, students, parents, teachers, faculty, uh, they're all important. At the end of the day though, we are representing the student. And so I think it is important that we listen to them. Um, whether they're in elementary school, middle or high school, they all have something to add. And that's going back to the surveys that I keep referring to. Where do they think that there can be improvement? Um, they may be telling their parents at home what they like and what they don't like, they may not. And so, um, you know, kindergarten obviously might be different than fifth grade. And so we can take a look at that in our elementary schools. But overall, both voices are important. But at the end of the day, uh, we should listen to our students. Thank you, Jeannie. Um, all, all voices are important and we should listen to everyone. I think one of the things is it's easier to listen to parents' voice because they're more vocal and it's harder to listen to the student's voice because they don't have an outlet really to talk to the Board of Education. They don't come to the board meetings, they don't do that. So I think when we talked about going to the schools and talking to students, it's really important. But also as a parent, I have the opportunity to actually talk to a lot of kids through my children and I think that's really important too. And to help, the, to help them to have a place where they can talk and give, like surveys is a great idea. Another idea is to have meetings where kids can attend to talk to the teachers or even to us about what's on their minds. Because you know what I find? It's sometimes very different what parents want or what parents think than what kids do. But it's important to listen to everybody and to weigh each opinion and to weigh everyone's opinion. Thank you, Matt. Uh, so as a parent of two kids, I know that I don't always listen to their ideas. Otherwise, we'd have pizza every night. And it doesn't mean that their voice doesn't matter, but it is a situational. You have to look at it in context. To say that you're always going to listen to students or you're always going to listen to parents is unfair. What you need to do is you need to listen to them when it directly affects them. And we have to trust that our parents are holding the best interest of their student in mind. That is their child. And for us to, to question a parental decision, it's, it's not our place. We need to support the parent and we need to support the child. Now that does not mean that we cannot listen to suggestions from students to hear their ideas. Uh, but ultimately, the decision-making process lies with the parents, as does you know, the weight of every subject is on the parents. The parents are responsible. Thank you. All right, the next question, we'll start with Megan. What would you change in the classroom, and how would your work on the board accomplish this goal? 
Well, I think that overall, one thing that all teachers would agree on is smaller class sizes. So that's one thing I can say without a doubt that that I would hope to change. Um, and so that is important. As far as uh, individually, each classroom, I think it's up to that individual teacher to see what they need, um, specifically whether that be for projects or other things. One thing though that I would like to look at is the implementation uh, of a one-to-one -one Chromebook program and just look and see how much that would cost um, and those things. We do have that in Redondo Beach. Um, third graders on up have a Chromebook that they take home daily. And so this allows students to have a, a Chromebook that they do take home and they're able to use it uh, for research projects, turning in assignments online, and students really do like it. So for example, if there's a research project on something, open up your Chromebooks and let's start to research instead of saying, oh, well, we don't have the cart today, so we can't do that. And so um, I think that is something to look at and just see. Um, maybe we can look implement it over time or do a trial run. I think that looking at the next generation science standards is something that is important. We are going through a language arts adoption right now. And so I do think though that science is really important and we need to look forward on that and go through some sort of piloting program with that curriculum in the future. So those are some ideas that I have for the classroom. Thank you. Jeannie. Um, one of the things we, is class sizes, of course, but in order to have smaller class sizes, we also have to have more revenue and more money in the budget to hire more teachers. And I think that's really important. You know, all studies show that the smaller the class size, the better that, the better the student learns. You know, Palo Alto has this class size of 14 to one, and I think that makes a huge difference. They also have a bigger budget than we do. So I think that's really important to look at. One of the things that I looked at, Wheeler he talked about four things that make a class uh, a school innovative, and one of the things is innovative furniture. That's a very simple thing we could bring to our district, movable furniture. Where I, when I went to go to Mira Catalina, I actually saw Mrs. Marks. She had movable furniture, and these ball, yoga balls you could sit on for like $20, and I see it across, across a district that teachers are implementing these things already. But we could also do that district-wide. Can we have a program where we buy these movable furniture as a district and move them around? But also to ask the teachers, because I think the teachers would give great input on what they think would be important for our classes. And I think that's really important. Because once again, I think as a district, we need to listen to our teachers and our students. Thank you. Matt. Thank you. Um, I'm not going to presume to tell a teacher what she needs to do in her classroom. Uh, they each have their idea and they have their method of teaching. And all I want to do is be able to support them, to give them what they need to accomplish their goals. We have some older whiteboards that are in classrooms and you talk to the teachers and they're like, oh, we never use those. You go to other schools and the whiteboards are used constantly. So it matters. It matters what is actually gonna be used in the classroom. It is to, again, support the teachers, but not to encumber them with projects or with items they're not gonna use. I mean, one of the things I love, the, the flexible seating and you know the fact that you know we offer that to our students, but not all teachers are comfortable with it. And to say that one idea is right or one is wrong is not my place. It is for the teacher to decide what is the most effective way to teach in her classroom. Thank you. Rick. So, so one of the things that's been cut over the years has been um, the educator effectiveness funds you know, from the state. And so we don't have as much money from that pot of money from the state to really help our teachers teach and learn how to teach better through professional development. You talk to the teachers. One of the things that they value the most in professional development is collaboration um, across site at either the same grade level if they're in elementary school or at the same department or course structure level if they're at you know, a secondary school. So I think it's important to give our t teachers the tools to become better teachers because it's the quality of instruction in the classrooms that matters. 
We also don't really access um, a lot of the data that's out there in terms of informing our instruction, and we could do a better job of teaching our teachers how to use the data that is available so that they could understand the gaps in the instruction and education that they're delivering to improve the outcomes that we're getting for our students. Next board meeting, we're actually gonna have a data presentation on exactly the data in the district. You know, class, classroom reduction is, is great, you know. Who can argue with, I'd like to have a classroom of 10 or 12 kids? You know, one of the reasons we chose the college for our kids was because of the class size. It is absolutely one of the most expensive things that you can do in a district. Um, you know, to, it's very expensive to move the ratio from 25 to 24 to one, for example, and you just can't do it district-wide, and especially you can't do it district-wide if at the same time you're trying to give raises because the math just does not work. Thank you. Okay, now we're gonna start with Jeannie. What methods do you think would keep our students safe in today's environment? Um, one of the things, you know, safety, there's a lot of words associated with safety. There's bullying, um, and I think when you worry about safety, we talk about um, a shooter on campus. And I've been looking at researching stuff, and one of the things is cameras. I mean, that's one thing that I think we could implement more is more cameras on our school district. And also to talk back about, you know, when I visit every, I visit several schools and each principal and teachers have their own ideas what that school needs. And I think we should listen to them because they know their school best. And they know what, it's gonna work at their school district. When I first started visiting the schools, I had a, I just had this conceived notion of what was best. But then as the more schools I visit, I realized that once again, the, each school's individual. Like one school said they wanted more cameras. Another school told me they would like some kind of entry point where you know one person could go walk in. And we have to listen to that. And we have to ask that question. And we, then whatever they decide, we need to support their decision. Because I think the parents and the teachers and the principal know their school the best. And we can't dictate what they can do. I mean, there's some things we could, like they put the black film on every school. I mean, that's something they did district wide. But when you talk to the teachers and you talk to the parents at that school site, there is different opinions about what happened there. And I think that's an example about letting school sites make certain decisions for themselves. Thank you. Matt. I could speak about school safety ad nauseum and maybe <laughs> whack me in the head with that paddle by the time I was done. Uh, as a counterterrorism and force protection subject matter expert for the government, it was my job to assess facilities for their risks and to find out what we could do to mitigate those risks. And when we look at schools, the hard truth is that the risk that we face is coming from our own students or former students. So rather than looking at building fences, arming teachers, putting in metal detectors, what we need to do is we need to make sure that we are focusing on mental health, that we are getting the students the help that they need. You know, currently we have, you know, positive behavior, um, inter intervention, support, the PBIS, I always mess that up. Um, but we have programs that are in place to help students. Um, I look at the situation where when even in bullying or, you know, God forbid, a, a shooting, up until the point that that person takes action, they're still a child and they still need help. The bullier needs to learn how to handle his emotions and he needs to learn, you know, how to deal with the stresses that he faces. Um, you know, we need to make sure that our students have portable skills so that when they leave the hill, they're not leaving our nice, you know, insulated community and going out into a cold world without knowing what to do, without having situational awareness, and without knowing how to react in times of danger. Thank you. Yeah, so I think um, safety is on the mind of everybody that's involved in a school system anywhere in America. Um, Improving the security of a site is expensive and it would not have prevented two of the worst tragedies that happened in schools, both Sandy Hook in elementary school and Santa Fe, which was the school in Texas last year that, that had an active shooter after Parkland, were both extremely hardened sites. And so that's not the way to solve the problem. 
Um, we do need to invest in the mental health of the students. We need to identify um, the students and the members of the school community that have mental health problems. It's um, you know exacerbated by substance abuse in our community, uh, and it's a big problem. Uh, and if we need to, if we're about saving lives and protecting the lives of our students, we need to invest more and do it in, in partnership with the rest of the community, uh, the community, the city governments, the health system, the faith organizations, all have a vested interest in the safety and health of our community, and we need to partner with them. The school district can play an important part, but it's a big problem, and it's a problem that we don't have the funds to solve. You know, it's it's a massive problem across the country, but we need to do more. And you know, in particular, in school shooting. One of the areas of education that I'd like to uh, make sure is deployed throughout the district is the Sandy Hook Promise, which helps uh, the staff identify those people who are in need of support and could turn into a violent situation before it happens. Thank you. Megan. So I think that there are a few things that we should focus on uh, with safety. Um, the first thing is I think that the district has done a great job with uh, the Run, Hide, Fight program that they did this year. Um, we've been doing that in Redondo for a little bit now, and so I think that's great that that's a priority and continue need, continues uh, to be a priority so that students, teachers, faculty, and parents all know what will happen if the um, instance comes up where there is an active shooter or some sort of other person on campus. So I think we need to continue to make that a priority and run drills accordingly. Um, also what's important is focusing on mental health. So definitely the, the solution is not arming teachers um, or anything like that. It's, it's focusing on mental health. So why are these students doing that in the first place? And so we need to identify students who may be at risk, who feel left out in some way at school, um, make sure that we're helping them and, and targeting them uh, so that they feel safe um, on campus. And it is important to listen to feedback from the community. Uh, we can't just have one size fits all, oh, let's just fence all of our schools and that solves the problem. Uh, not true at all. And so we need to listen to community members there. Uh, it's important to build tolerance and communication skills with our students too and make sure that all teachers and all schools um, are providing the social and emotional skills that students need to succeed. And also too, I think we need to focus on uh, cyberbullying that also doesn't make students feel safe. And that kind of goes hand in hand with cell phones on campus and that's something we need to, to make a priority. Thank you. Okay, we are running out of time, so we're going to go to closing statements now. <laughs> and we're going to start with Rick and then work our way down. And you have one minute for your closing, okay? Well, thanks again to the League of Women Voters, and especially Mary Ellen, for moderating today's oh, debate or forum, and, and the PTA Coordinating Council. Really appreciate it. And also appreciate all the questions that came from the audience. I think they stimulated a great discussion and gave you really the first opportunity to see where all four of us come out on uh, you know, topics of concern for the district. I think uh, you know, we covered a bunch of items today. Uh, you know, the budget, mental health, food in the classrooms, volunteerism, student input, safety, independent thinking, the role of the board, and this is a wide-ranging ranging discussion, and it's great. And we need more means for the community to provide input and interaction with the board. School issues are complex, multifaceted issues, and the more thoughts that get brought to solve the problems, the better off we are. You know, if elected, I look forward to working with the community and my fellow board members to ensure that our kids receive the best education possible in a safe environment. And I ask you for your vote on November 6th, and thank you for taking the time to get informed and participate in the process. Thank you, Matt. Thank you for everyone for being here and listening and sharing your questions. And I really have appreciated hearing the other comments of the fellow candidates. Um, knowing that at least three of the four of us will be working together, it is great that we share a lot of the same goals, that we are really concerned about the well-being of our students. And looking forward, you know, um, I, what it, 
it's kind of a, a difficult thing because we have a, a great district and we have great students, um, but I think we also need to look at what happens when they get offside the off the hill um, to investigate how they're performing in college. We have a college readiness factor, but let's see how they actually do at college. How many of those who you know make it into college are are doing well? And so we just need to make sure that we are looking ahead, that we are making sure that we have done everything we possibly can for our students. Uh, so I would please ask that you vote on November 6th for Matt Brock. It's number four. Thank you. Jeannie. First of all, I'd like to thank everyone who stayed the whole two hours. I so appreciate you guys staying. I know that was hard. Um, you know, when I decided to run for board, one of the things I wanted to do is make a difference in, our, in the district. And that's what I think all of us are here to do. And I want to say that when you look at the candidates, remember to remember it's to look at not just the words, but the actions of what the person has done. And I think that's really important. And I think that with a solid board and with the new superintendent, we have, we're sitting on the cusp of doing great things with our, with our district. We have a wonderful district. We have wonderful parents and wonderful kids and wonderful teachers and staff. And one of the things that we can do is to build those bridges so we feel more like one hill. And that's really important. So on November 6th, or if you have a mail-in ballot and you're gonna put that little, <laughs> circle the little circle, I ask that you vote for me, Jeannie Hahn. Thank you. Thank you. Megan. Thank you so much for coming tonight. And I think we can all say at the end of the day, whether we have students in the district or not, we should all care about our schools. Uh, great schools lead to higher property values, um, which people want. And of course, we should all care about the well being of the students that are here. Uh, they are the future, and we need to make sure that we're doing the best for them uh, that we can. As a former student here, I want to help these kids, I want to make sure that they have what they need to succeed. Um, I care about students, no matter what their GPA is or what kind of needs they have. If elected as a board member, I'll now think of the 11,000 students uh, that go to PV schools as my kids too. Um, I want what is best for them. And it is important to note that if I'm not elected, there will be no one on uh, the Board of Education that has an education background, and I think that that would be a great mistake. We need diversity, we need someone on the board that has that education. So if you believe in the quality of students produced by PV schools, believe in having a teacher's voice on the board, and believe in the next generation wanting to make a difference in the world and give back to their community, uh, then vote for me, Megan Crawford, on November 6th, first on the ballot. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Okay. <clears throat> All right, this concludes our candidate forum for the Palos Verdes Unified School District um, School Board. Um, we also want to, th on behalf of the Palos Verdes League of Women Voters and the Palos Verdes PTA Council, I want to thank all of you for coming. I want to thank our candidates for participating. We had wonderful questions from the audience, and I really appreciate it. We had so many more questions than we had time to answer or to ask. I want to remind the audience that this has been taped uh, by RPV Channel and it's going to be rebroadcast on cable, so look for that. And I also want to remind you that some of the candidates do have campaign materials out in the lobby for you to look at and take home and study. So let's give our candidates another round of applause for running, it's marvelous. Thank you, the forum's over.